Howdy! This video is on solids. Solids compose a large fraction of the compounds in the world. Some of the interactions that hold solids together are unique to solids. And so the concept of solids or the topic of solids is fairly important. After watching this video, you should be able to describe what a unit cell is. You should be able to describe the characteristics of cubic unit cells. You should be able to describe the different types of solids and the forces that keep them together. It's really kind of cool. What we'll see is that the physical properties of a solid are determined by the intermolecular forces that hold the solid together. You should be able to put a series of solids in order of increasing melting point based on interactions that hold them together. And so solids, the particles are close together if they're ions or if they're molecules, and you have strong intermolecular forces. Um, intermolecular forces are much more important than kinetic energy in solids. Now, you always have vibrations in solids, always, always, always. Even at zero Kelvin, you will have vibrations in solids. But intermolecular forces are strong enough that it keeps the particles um, relatively close to each other and in, in the right position. So solids tend to be highly rigid and incompressible. Now, crystal structures consist of a stack of unit cells. And so you can kind of think about unit cell analogous to a molecule. And so if you have a molecule and then you propagate it, you can actually form a liquid. If you have a unit cell and then you propagate it in three dimensions along the three axes, then you can actually form the crystal. And so I think of unit cells as analogous to molecules. Unit cells are the smallest repeating unit that has all the symmetry characteristics of the crystal. And so basically from the unit cell, you can recreate the crystal. In solid cesium chloride, each cesium ion, here colored blue, is surrounded by eight chloride ions and vice versa. The crystal structure is constructed from its unit cell by stacking the cells together without any gaps in between. And so you should remember that a crystal is going to contain a really, really huge number of unit cells. And so like a single crystal of table salt is going to contain something like 10 to the 19th unit cells, a really, really large number. Unit cells are very, very small. Atoms molecules are obviously really, really small. Now, there are only 14 possible types of unit cells. And so there's only 14 ways of really packing these things. And so for cubic, each of these edges are the same, and all the angles are 90 degrees. Now, you do have three different types of cubic unit cells. You have simple or primitive, um, body center cubic, and face center cubic. Tetragonal means that two of the lengths are the same, a third length is different. And so you have prim primary, uh, sorry, primitive cube, uh, tetragonal, or you have body center tetragonal. For orthorhombic, all three edges are different lengths. And you actually have four different orthorhombic unit cells. For monoclinic, now you, we have the first unit cell that doesn't have everything 90 degrees. Um, triclinic, hexagonal, we got 120 degrees there, and trigonal. And so only really 14 unit cells, only 14 ways of packing the unit cells. We will be most concerned with the cubic unit cells. And so again, primitive, um, body center cubic, and face center cubic. Now these dots here, they can represent a cation, a cation or an anion, if you're talking about an ionic material, a molecule if you're talking about a molecular solid, or an uh, atom if you're talking about a network solid. And so for instance, if you cool argon down low enough, eventually it will form a solid. Remember, if you cool any gas down low enough, eventually it does, does condense into a liquid than a solid. Not always a liquid, but eventually it will get down to a solid. And so if you notice, we had a face center cubic. Um, and so here's 
um, face and then there's the one in the center. And so each of these dots, each of the dots represents an argon atom. For methane, it also forms a face center cubic. In this case, each dot represents a methane molecule. And so when we're talking about these dots here, again, a dot can represent an atom like an argon, a molecule like in methane, or an ion like in terms of an ionic solid. Shows how the three cubic unit cells arise. Arrange a layer of spheres in horizontal and vertical rows. Note the large diamond-shaped space among the particles. Placing the next layer directly over the first gives a structure based on the simple cubic unit cell. Those larger spaces mean an inefficient use of space. In fact, only 52% of the available volume is actually occupied by spheres. Because of this inefficiency, the simple cubic unit cell is seen rarely in nature. A more efficient stacking occurs if we place the second layer over the spaces formed by the first layer and the third layer over the spaces formed by the second. That simple change leads to 68% of the available volume occupied by the spheres and a structure based on the body-centered cubic unit cell. Many metals, including all the alkali metals, adopt this arrangement. For the most efficient stacking, shift every other row in the first layer so the large diamond-shaped spaces become smaller triangular spaces and place the second layer over them. Then the third layer goes over the holes visible through the first and second layers. In this arrangement, called cubic closest packing, spheres occupy 74% of the volume. Note that it is based on the face-centered cubic unit cell. And so three types of cubic unit cells, the simple cubic unit cell, body-centered cubic unit cell, and face-centered cubic unit cell. And so it's really kind of interesting if you look at the percent volume occupied. For the simple cubic unit cell, only 52% of the volume is occupied. And so you can actually do this calculation. And so if you imagine these spheres are touching each other, you can calculate how much space, how much volume the cube has, and then you can calculate how much of that is occupied by the spheres, assuming that the spheres are touching, and you get 52%. And so that's not very efficient, and so not a lot of compounds actually use the simple cubic unit cell. The body center cubic unit cell, you have a particle in the middle, is a little bit more efficient at 68%, and the face center cubic unit cell is more efficient at 74%. And so you'd imagine that there should be a correlation between the volume occupied and the strength of the intermolecular forces. And so the stronger the intermolecular forces, the more intermolecular forces, it should be the more stable. And so the more efficient packing typically, I think is the more stable packing, the more common packing, so face center cubic, is a fairly common way for elements to pack. Now these are some characteristics we can actually think about for the different unit cells. And so we had we talked about the volume per percent volume occupied. Now if you think about the uh, shapes, you should be able to determine the particles per unit cell and the coordination number. And so if we look at the simple cubic unit cell, notice that there's a particle on each of the corner. Now each of the corners. Now each of these particles um, donate an eighth into that unit cell. And so you have eight corners times one eighth, and that gives us one particle per unit cell. Remember that, you know, this particle is actually shared by eight different unit cells. Now it's the same with the body center cubic on the corner. Each is donating one eighth to this unit cell, so that gives you one. And then you have the particle in the center, and so that gives you two. So you have two particles per unit cell for the body center cubic. For the face center cubic, again, eight corners times one eighth gives you one. Now on the faces, you know, this is gonna be shared by two different unit cells, and so it's contributing a half to this unit cell. There's six faces times a half, that gives us three, plus the one from the corners, and so we have four particles per unit cell. Now the coordination number sometimes can be a little bit tricky, so if we think about coordination numbers next nearest neighbor, and so this particle, we'll see that one, that one, that one, but also one above this, 
one to the side of that and one to the side. And so that actually gives you six. And so you have to be able to imagine the particles that aren't being shown. For the body center cubic, if you think about the one in the center, it's that got four here and then the four there. So the corners, and so that would be a coordination number of eight. For the face center cubic, it's a little bit more tricky. And so if you're looking at this particle here, you have um, this plane has four. Now you're gonna have another plane with four and then a third plane with four. And so three times four gives us a coordination number of 12. And so simple cubic, it's not very efficient. And so not many elements actually use it. Polonium is the only known element that uses simple cubic. Body center cubic, iron, sodium, potassium are examples of elements that form the body center cubic. Face center cubic, you know, we have examples of aluminum, copper, silver, and gold. Now there's four different main types of solids, um, metallic, ionic, network, molecular. Now we can actually understand um, the physical properties if we understand the intermolecular forces that are holding the solid together. And so these four have different types of intermolecular forces. I should also mention that some solids can actually have more than one type of interaction. And so you can actually have, um, it's common to have, say, something that looks like a network and then have some ions to charge balance things. But in general, we can think about these four, but again, some solids can have more than one interaction. And again, the reason this is important is that if we understand the interactions that are holding the solid together, often we can understand the macroscopic um, properties. So for example, metals, iron, silver, copper, etc. Um, the way we can think about a metal is as positive metal ions surrounded by a sea of conduction electrons. And so when a metal is formed, the metal atom loses electron, that electron goes into a conduction band. And so you have these positive ions in a sea of conduction electrons. And so the metal is held together by electrostatic attraction between the ions and the electrons. Now that leads to the properties of metals. They're malleable, ductile, good electroconductivity, good heat conductivity. They have a wide range of hardnesses and melting points. And so again, the way you can think about a metal is we have these positive ions in a sea of conduction electrons. Now for this, for metals, those dots that we just saw in the unit cell, those positions, um, describe placement of the positive ions. The mobility of conduction electrons in a metal accounts for the luster, the malleability, ductility, electrical and thermal conductivity. And so in terms of luster, when light hits a metal surface, it causes the conduction electrons to oscillate, which produces the reflection. When you pound on a metal, you can displace the ions, but you're not breaking the interaction. And so that's why metals you know, are malleable because you can move these ions without breaking the interaction. The interaction that's holding the metal together is the electrostatic attraction between the, metal, the positive ions and the conduction electrons. Um, thermal conductivity, heat conductivity, uh, thermal conductivity and conduction, um, electrical conductivity come from the mobility of the conduction electrons. Now it's kind of cool. You can actually fine tune a metal's property by mixing different metals. And so a mixture of metals is referred to as an alloy. And so yellow, br yellow brass is copper and zinc. Stainless steel, iron, chromium, and nickel resist corrosions. Plumber solder, um, iron, uh, sorry, lead and tin has a fairly low melting point. Sterling silver, silver and copper. A uh, pewter, tin, antimony and copper. Dental amalgam, uh, silver, tin, mercury and copper. Um, pure gold is often too soft to be used as, as jewelry, so it's often mixed with another metal and to make 14 karat gold, which is much harder. But it's really kind of cool, by mixing metals, you can actually fine tune their properties. But we, we can understand where the metal gets the property by understanding the interactions that hold the metal together. Positive ions and sea conduction electrons, that leads to the metal being malleable, um, ductile, conduct electricity, conduct um, heat.
ionic solids we've talked about, um, it's just the electrostatic attraction between the opposite charged particles. So table salt is an ionic solid. Now this interaction can be pretty strong, and so ionic solids tend to be rigid, have high melting points, poor electroconductivity, and often they're water soluble. Now it's kind of interesting in terms of the unit cells, those dots that we talked about previously, those can be a positive ion or a negative ion. For the structure of unit cell, often for the structure of ionic solid, often the way you can think about it is one of the ions, uh, typically an anion, taking up positions on on um, a unit cell, and then the negative ion, sorry, the positive ion, going inside the holes for that unit cell. Many elements, covalent compounds, and as you'll see in the next two examples, ionic compounds adopt cubic closest packing. Sodium chloride adopts the sodium chloride or rock salt structure, as do many other alkali, halides, alkaline earth oxides and sulfides, and other ionic compounds. Picture separate face-centered cubic arrays of chloride ions and sodium ions as they approach and interpenetrate each other. The smaller sodium ions fit in the holes between the larger chloride ions and the NaCl unit cell. Zinc sulfide adopts the zinc blend structure, as do the copper-1 halides and several other compounds. If face-centered cubic arrays of zinc ions and sulfide ions approach and interpenetrate slightly offset from each other, each ion becomes surrounded tetrahedrally by four of the other ions. Note the blinking zinc ion and the four sulfides. You can see the relative positions in this slightly expanded view of the zinc blend unit cell. And so obviously, uh, often the way to think about it is saying the negative ions are taking these last positions and then the positive ions are taking the holes. And so this, the structure of the solid will actually depend on the relative size between the do two different ions. Sodium chloride can be built by first constructing a face-centered unit cell of chloride ions. The smaller sodium ions can then fit into the spaces or holes between chloride ions. Notice that each sodium ion in one of the lattice holes is surrounded by six chloride ions at the corners of an octahedron. Therefore, the sodium ions are said to fill octahedral holes. And so cesium chloride and sodium chloride both have the same empirical formula one to one. But because the relative sizes are different, they take slightly different um, structures. And so cesium chloride, you have the rock salt structure, and sodium chloride, you have the sodium chloride structure. The relative sizes of the ions of cesium chloride make it possible for the cesium ion to fit snugly into the hole between four chloride ions. In contrast, sodium ions are relatively small. The distance between the sodium and chloride ions is too great for the sodium ions to be attracted to the chloride ions when occupying that hole. The structure of sodium chloride is, therefore, different than that of cesium chloride. And so the solid will take the shape that maximizes the intermolecular forces, maximizes the attraction. Now we've talked about lattice enthalpy before and we saw that the larger the charges, the stronger electrostatic attraction, the larger lattice enthalpy, the higher the melting point, the smaller the ions, the closer the ions. And the most important consideration is the size of the charges, the absolute value of the charges. But also in here would be the actual structure that the ionic solid is going to take. You know, the cesium chloride versus sodium chloride, you'd expect that the attraction would be a little bit different. It's not on this flow diagram because typically we, we neglect it at this level of chemistry.
And so for ionic solids, it's the electrostatic attraction between the opposite charged ions that actually lead to the formation of the solid. And that causes the solid to have a fairly strong interaction, so a fairly high melting point, um, no conductivity of, or very few, little conductivity of, of electricity. And so if we understand the atomic level, we can understand uh, the macroscopic level. Network solids, you have one, two, or three-dimensional networks of covalent bonds. And so covalent bonds are what causes the network solid to actually stay together. Now because of this, network solids have a wide range of hardnesses and melting points, um, typically fairly poor therm um, electroconductivity. So here are two examples of network solids. And so on the left, we have diamond. On the right, we have graphite. And so for the diamond, each carbon is surrounded by four other carbons, and these are all covalent bonds. And then this carbon is surrounded by four other carbons, again, all covalent bonds. And so it's a network of covalent bonds. Now for graphite, you have carbon surrounded by three other carbons, and so these are covalent bonds. And these form long sheets. Now these two sheets here are actually attracted to each other using London dispersion. And so the graphite is actually an example of a mixture of two types of interactions. You have the network solid in the plane, and then you have London dispersion between the different planes. For diamond, it has the structure. For silicon, it has a very similar structure. And so you can actually replace some of the carbons in diamond with silicon. It's a little bit cheaper to make, and so you can make silicon carbide. Diamond, an allotrope of carbon, and silicon have the same solid structure. Chemists take advantage of this similarity by making silicon carbide, which combines some of the hardness of diamond with a much lower cost of production. And so network solids are composed of networks of covalent bond atoms. And so they tend to be hard and rigid um, and have, can have a very wide range of melting points and are insoluble in water. Molecular solids are when molecules condense forming a solid. And so you're going to have London dispersion, dipole-dipole, or hydrogen bonding. Remember, hydrogen bonding is a special form of dipole-dipole. And so of the solids that we've talked about, um, molecular solids tend to have the lowest melting points. They typically are soft and poor electroconductivity. And so here we have C60. And so if you remember those little dots again in, in the cubic unit cell, now for C60, each of those dots rep is repre represents a C60 molecule. The spherical C60 molecule is attracted by induced dipole intermolecular forces to other C60 molecules. The C60 molecules pack together as efficiently as possible, which means that each C60 molecule is surrounded by six others in a layer. As successive layers are added, the result is a face-centered cubic arrangement of C60 molecules, with each molecule surrounded by 12 others. And so induced dipole induced dipole is also referred to as London dispersion. Ice is another example of a molecular solid, and so you have molecules, water molecules, attract to each other using hydrogen bonds, um, and it has a fairly low melting point. Ice is held together as a solid by hydrogen bonds. When ice melts to liquid water, the regular, relatively open structure of ice collapses. Liquid water can be more efficiently packed and denser than ice. And so if we add heat, we're going to increase the kinetic energy at the atomic level. Temperatures just measure kinetic energy at the atomic level. And as you add heat, you're adding kinetic energy. And so eventually the molecules have enough kinetic energy to partially overcome the intermolecular forces. And so it's really kind of cool. If you understand the forces that keep the solids together, we can understand how that leads to the macroscopic properties. You know, for again, metals, you have the metallic bonding, positive ions and the C conduction electrons leads to thermal and electrical conductivity, malleable and ductile. Uh, ionic solids, you have the strong ion-ion interaction, which leads to fairly high melting points.
Network solids, you have networks of covalent bonds, which can lead to something fairly hard. Um, molecular solids, you have typically the weakest intermolecular forces holding the solid together, and so it typically has the lowest melting points, and there's no very little electroconductivity. I hope that was helpful.